Welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. My name is David Duck and I'm your host today. Today our two guests are Janice Thompson, who is the Executive Director of Common Cause Oregon. Common Cause was founded in 1970 while Lyndon Johnson was president as a citizen's lobby to make the U.S. political system more open and accountable. Our second guest is James Offsink. Uh, who is a member of the City Club of Portland and has for the past year been working on a, um, a research committee looking at redistricting in the state of Oregon. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Good. Mm -hmm. So our, our first question I think is what is redistricting? Why do we do it every 10 years? Yeah. Okay. Um, we're actually, I'll touch on this maybe in a second, we're not actually limited in most places to doing it only every 10 years, oh. but it's required that we do do it at least once every 10 years. And the idea is that as populations shift and you know people move from rural areas to urban areas or demographics change within cities or rural areas, that we need to make sure that each district is roughly equivalent in population. So that um, the idea being that one person's one vote regardless of where they live, has the same weight on their uh, state representatives. Okay. Is, is this a, a constitutional requirement? Yes. Mm -hmm. that, that at the federal level, yes, and then oh. each state would have their own uh, designations, be it in constitution or in law, that state oh. how it's practiced within that state. So in Oregon, it is constitutional and okay. also in Oregon revised statutes. Okay. All right. So the, and just to follow mm -hmm. up on that, what that means then, in Oregon there are... Um, 60 House legislative districts and 30 Senate districts. And so um, after the census is done, uh, the each district is evaluated about how much it either has to shrink, you know, or grow to meet the new population targets. Mm -hmm. And then the big thing at the congressional level is apportioning uh, across the states um, how many congressional districts are go to each state because there's what 435, 435. Mm -hmm. and so one of the big things that people were thinking about in Oregon wondering about in Oregon is whether or not the Oregon's population had grown to the extent that we would have moved from five to six congressional districts which would that, have had a huge impact right. then on how really districts how they were drawn yeah. right, right. Mm -hmm. that didn't happen and so the congressional redistricting um, went, I think, a little bit more more uh, smoothly. Uh, mm -hmm. Was less 
Uh, it, it would have been a much yeah. more bigger deal right. if, if we had been talking about six, because that would have just meant a much more wholesale mm -hmm. redrawing. Mm -hmm. But the five congressional districts also needed to be tweaked in their boundaries because of the popu you know, population growth overall, mm -hmm. and then the shifts or the changes kind Between of in, mm -hmm. in terms of the overall. Okay, all right. So this is something we didn't talk about before the show, but it just occurred to me while we are mm -hmm. talking about this. It seems to me that it would be more democratic if, as population grows, the size of the U.S. House also grew. And currently, we're restricted, and I don't know how, mm -hmm. why we're restricted, because I don't think it's in the Constitution, to uh, to always having only 400 and what, 30, 35 mm -hmm. representatives. So, so in effect, and every time the population grows, our, each of our representatives supposedly represents a larger number of people. Mm -hmm. And Definitely. I mean, it hasn't always been from the beginning that there were four and 35. So in fact, the size of the House of Representatives has grown. I think originally it was in the Constitution, and I, I could have this number wrong, but I think that each representative in the House of Representatives was supposed to represent 6,000 mm -hmm. eligible okay. voters, uh -huh. which were, of course, white right. men of a you know land holding. Um, so I mean, not uh, yeah. people, but uh -huh. the whole, and so it did continue to grow, and eventually it got to the point where it seemed as though it was unworkable to do, you know, to make decisions as an entire body. And mm -hmm. so at that point, I don't think it is constitutional, but the oh. decision was made to Some, cap it at 435. Right. I mean, nevertheless, um, I think there are some folks who would suggest that, you know, the size of the House of Representatives, you know, should maybe be nudged up some. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm one of those folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's just the sweet spot there between mm -hmm. representation and having an unwield, you know, having just so many people mm -hmm. in, in, mm -hmm. in okay. Congress. It's yeah. unwieldy. Okay. So, so in, in Oregon, this time, it appears that we had a reasonably smooth redistricting process of can one of you describe how that process worked in, in Oregon? Well, in Oregon, the <coughs> legislature is charged with redrawing both the legislative and congressional lines. And there's probably more of a track record in Oregon of the legislature, you know, you know doing this recently. Um, for the first half of the century, though they were charged with this task, they did not. Um, redraw the lines and um, the what I call the modern era of redistricting really began in the 60s after a 1952 ballot measure that set up the Secretary of State as the backup entity um, so part of the reason the legislature could basically ignore their constitutional mandate during uh, most of the first half of the last century because there was like no mechanism to get them to mm -hmm. do better. And this so is true in many states, especially mm -hmm. in the South, states who would not want to reapportion for racial reasons or for city versus rural reasons, mm -hmm. and they would just continue to say, well, the legislature has failed, I guess we'll continue with the same districts as they were drawn. Um, and so Oregon was similar mm -hmm. until uh -huh. 1952. Yeah. Okay. And so that ballot measure set up the Secretary of State's office as the backup entity in case of either legislative inaction or a gubernatorial veto regarding the legislative districts. And the other dynamic that started to come up in the, in, in the 1960s into the 70s uh, was the courts agreeing to play a more active role. Because part of what James described as, you know, like legislators just saying, oh, you know, we think it, the old lines are good enough, is that there was also the, the courts just had a, had a, had set precedent of like, that's a legislative function, yep. but it's up to them. We're unwilling mm -hmm. to really right. get involved. Uh. So that's the other element in kind of establishing, I think, you know, both in Oregon modern and era. in yep. other states as well, kind of this mm -hmm. modern era was a series of, of court cases. But so what that means um, is that the, in 2011, um, the political dynamics were that the Democrats had 
a narrow majority in the Oregon Senate. Uh, one indication, however, that I think uh, legislative leadership was really interested in having the legislature, you know, carry out this process is that the Senate president president established a Senate redistricting committee that was equally divided between Republicans and Democrats, even though that wasn't quite the makeup of the Senate. Mm -hmm. The House of Representatives, however, was split half and half, and so there, the House Redistricting Committee was also split half and half. And I think there were a lot of folks who said that's going to be a recipe for disaster. You know, no way are they going to, you know, be able to pull this off. Um, I actually always had some level of confidence that the that they would succeed in the legislative line drawing. Um, and in part because, because of con of the concern of Republicans that they did not want the process to go to the Secretary of State, mm -hmm. and I mean, in one of the because the Secretary of State was Democrat, a Democrat, right. mm -hmm. um, and so one of the members of the House Redistricting Committee, for example, described the negotiation as being kind of with one hand, you know, behind his back. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, part of the reason why I thought that they would probably still be able to pull off the legislative redistricting is that I think the way the overall demographics of the state has shaped up, the notion that a, sec a Democratic Secretary of State could have designed some plan radically better for Democrats, I don't think the numbers really bore out. And so mm -hmm. I think that's at the stage for the Democrats in the legislature also being kind of more willing to compromise. Where I was more surprised was that the fact that they um, agreed on a new congressional plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, I think <laughs> if we'd shifted to six congressional districts, I don't think they would have That's pulled it rough. off. Uh -huh. But, um, and, and if the, if there is not agreement or if the governor disagrees on a legislative bill outlining congressional districts that the courts are turned to as the backup entity and so there's just more uncertainty related to like well are we going to sue or what are we going to get if we right. sue mm -hmm. and um, the the cost of the lawsuit you know or a potential lawsuit in the congressional I think also helped um, mm -hmm. Certainly both sides said that, yeah. you know, in such a tight fiscal year, it was going to be really difficult to go to court about this, uh -huh. where the state would have to put Sizz, the bill for uh, Yeah, it. Sizzle mm -hmm. would make our, make our government look even yeah, worse just, in the eyes yeah. of the, right. the populace exactly. than, it's like, than it already does. Exactly, it's like, what are you doing spending right. money for this? <laughs> right. you know, right. It's inherently yeah. political uh -huh. process. Right. Okay. So I think one other aspect that I wanted to touch on, um, it, we have, as part of our study committee, interviewed the people involved in the 2011 redistricting. And another thing that really came through was how much they had worked together from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, establishing personal relationships by going around to a number of different public hearings all over the state beforehand, where the people who were going to be on this committee together really developed a trust for each other and an mm -hmm. openness and communication that they said was really important mm -hmm. throughout the process. Okay, all right. Looking forward, is there a reason to think that atmosphere of trust would go forward 10 years from now? Could we expect that again? And if, if not, then what do we do? Well, I, th I think the odds of it happening again, or at least not being an incredibly contentious partisan process, is more likely in Oregon than lots of other states. Mm -hmm. um, and again, partly that's because of some of the underlying demographics that um, you know, set the stage for not necessarily providing a lot of fertile ground for, you know, mm -hmm. completely partisan gerrymandering. But uh, Common Cause uh, has always been supportive of the notion that legislative bodies should not be drawing the districts that in a process that is basically, you know, selecting their own voters. Mm -hmm. um, and that a restricting commission um, is the way to go. It is a topic. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. A independent redistricting commission. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, um, and that is th the focus more of the mm -hmm. city clubs report. Mm -hmm. You know the question of who draws the lines. 
Um, in the Common Cause Oregon report on redistricting, we discussed, you know, the pros, you know, the advantages of an independent redistricting commission in terms of even in an Oregon situation where there's some track record of success, public trust would still be increased if the legislators who are, are, are just inherently going to look at it with a little bit more of a political lens than an independent commission would to mm -hmm. on. However, um, the other, I mean, there's kind of two categories of reform discussions. One relates to who should be drawing the lines. The other relates to how the lines are drawn. And so the Common Cause Oregon report focuses more on how uh, the lines are drawn, analyzes kind of, and from an analysis of the 2011 process more from that perspective makes a number of recommendations okay. that we feel are applicable kind of regardless of the question of who draws the lines. Okay, so why, why don't we, why don't we why don't okay. just talk about some of those okay. recommendations? Uh, well, there's nine, so let me just kind of run through them quickly. The top priority is right now Oregon's, uh, one of Oregon's good criteria is that lines are not to be drawn for partisan advantage. However, that doesn't mean that the voter registration and other political data can't be part of that official process. But that has been a tradition, and what this sets the stage for is the official process looking like it doesn't have uh, you know, the voter registration data factored into it. But in what I characterize as kind of a wink and a nod practice, the political there are outside political players who are paying for partisan analysis of draft districts that are then shared with the legislators behind uh, closed doors. Mm. And we definitely heard in our interviews that that is exactly what happens, that right. the first or the second section of ORS 188.010 says that no line should be drawn to favor a particular party or incumbent or other person, and yet as soon as the commission is formed, then they get the political data and they start talking about, okay, so if we shift this many mm -hmm. registered Democrats uh -huh. into this or take this many registered mm -hmm. Republicans out of this district, how's that going to shape uh -huh. it up? Right. So okay. there's this facade, however, that that's not happening that needs to be removed by making all that data, the voter registration, you know, public record. And mm -hmm. for example, when a draft proposal is put out, you know, kind of just to be more upfront. Because um, the analysis is occurring, um, but yeah, so when it's not part of the public, you know, process, it's not available mm -hmm. for independent verification, okay. like by either the press or the public. Right. So that's the first one. Okay. Um, you know, James mentioned the field hearings. Oregon does have a really good history of holding these field hearings that I think are valuable for the camaraderie, collegiality um, building that James mentions, but also is really necessary for to get people out to kind of hear from local folks who are the best experts in what constitutes a community interest and what that means, you know, varies across the state. Um, however, the field hearings are not required by law, and so a recommendation is to really put a set number in, <coughs> excuse me. The next hearing-related issue is um, requiring a minimum number of hearings on draft maps. And this is where um, there were draft maps released in the 2011 process with a meaningful number, three number, three hearings on actual draft maps. In the past, however, there's a little bit more of a track record of like, oh, there's these hearings, but then whatever party really is in power generates the maps and there's like you know, kind of a rush them through set of pro forma hearings and not mm -hmm. really open to the public. Right. So changing that by you know, requ having a requirement, because um, there's ways in which those field hearings, if they're not followed by hearings and actual draft maps, are really a sham. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, you know, there may be, they weren't like a total waste of time, but um, it, it, okay. Anyway, um, there's some interactions related to improvement related to the census. Um, you know, that sets the stage. Uh, county election administrators are the ones who have to implement, and so they, in, in creating them, 
uh, creating some opportunities for them to be more involved. There's loss of institutional memory because this is a process that only occurs every 10 years. So the recommendation to create an ongoing redistricting task force. Okay. Um, hey, uh, just define institutional memory. What are you, what are you talking about? Well, uh, people change. I mean, the same set of legislators are not going to be the same, uh, you know, necessarily in 10 years. Okay. Luckily, we have some legislators who were involved this time around who, you know, had been around. Um, but as much or more, uh, I think the Oregon process was very well staffed by members of the Legislative Committee Services Office of the Legislature. But, um, you know, the main staff person working, you know, kind of governing that process or kind of helping manage that process didn't do it 10 years ago. Oh, okay. And mm -hmm. 10 years is a pretty long time right. to make mm -hmm. to ensure that the same people are involved. Mm -hmm. So, um, another topic that I think is also touched on in the City Club is uh, how prison populations are counted can distort uh, redistricting, and that needs to be shifted. And then there's two recommendations related to congressional. Um, redistricting. One is unlike the legislative line drawing that operates under some strict timelines, there are no, in effect, um, no real timelines for the congressional redistricting and mm -hmm. that would help. And then um, there's also the need for some clarity in law about how to handle uh, a congressional special election that occurs um, oh, mm -hmm. Post redistricting, like we actually we saw mm -hmm. in the special. Right. Okay, so, sorry. Okay, good. So those are all like about how to do it. Like I say, that are applicable no matter who draws the lines. Okay, all right. We're we're at six minutes, yep. so I want to go to James. But before we go to James, real quickly, the question about the prison populations. Why is that important? Well, prisoners don't vote, okay. and so in the city of Pendleton, for example, they just. Um, redrew their county council lines and there's a, a prison in one of the council wards and so in effect there's th there are three council wards that have 4,000 voters. This one ward because the prison was c calculated into the population target um, it looks like there's 4,000 people, but there's a th the prison population is about 1,000, which mm -hmm. in effect means there's 3,000 people who have you know access to one city council member compared to 4,000. Sure. Okay. So that's what's going mm -hmm. on. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And it also, I mean, serves. I mean, the prison. I mean, as prisons have become so much more populated uh, yeah, over right. the last uh -huh. several decades. Um, it's really important too to think about, in general, where prisoners are coming and where they're going to be counted. You know, so, I mm -hmm. mean, some people see it as a drain on the political influence of cities and adding to the political influence of rural areas. I mean, which is not always the case, but it yeah. tends that prisons are not built in urban areas, and often prisoners come from urban areas. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Good. So let, let's get to the city club report. Yeah. What was what was the major finding in the city club report? Yeah, um, I think actually your question before of can we expect this again in 2021 is a really good place to start. Okay. Um, we think, we hope so, you know, <laughs> that uh, right. there's as good a process in 2021 as there was in 2011, uh -huh. but we don't think it's something that we could count on. Not but, guaranteed. And especially mm -hmm. not count on indefinitely, you know, even if 2021 does turn out that mm -hmm. way, you know, there's a lot of years that we want for Oregon to be. Uh, having redistricting uh, yeah right and we think that giving that task to the legislature really sets up um, a potential conflict of interest and even more importantly a, a perception problem mm -hmm. that uh, our, our study committee was born out of a 2009 committee uh, um, research paper that we did on partisanship and uh, partisanship in the legislature even when you ask legislators about about it is often tied to redistricting and how you know these voters were taken out of my district and these other ones were put in and it's all about yeah. whether I can stay here or not mm -hmm. and 
we think that it really needs to, from the public standpoint, be removed um, from legislature, legislators and given to an independent commission who can really look at it more objectively and hopefully produce an overall fairer and more um, believable re uh, result. Right. Okay. And, and your report makes a recommendation of how that commission would be would be composed. Yeah, um, I think that there's a lot of good ways to do it potentially, and there is some precedent in other states um, for using an independent commission. There are about six states right now who task a wholly independent commission with doing with the primary responsibility to do the process. Um, and there are about another seven or eight that do a commission separate from the, the legislature as a whole. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in those other six, there are a bunch of different ways that they compose them. And we didn't see in any of that one that was exactly perfect for the state of Oregon, um, just based on our resources here and our unique kind of demographic makeup. Mm -hmm. So we ultimately uh, recommended a nine-member commission that strives to achieve some of the diversity of the state, certainly in terms of geography, that commissioners should come from the various areas of the state, um, and also in terms of demographics that we want to see gender and ethnic diversity. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Um, and I don't know how specific you want me to get. No, into that, that, that's that's probably yeah. actually we have two minutes, and I need the last minute. Yeah, so no quickly, really quickly, tell us what happened in Texas because I, I really want to have the audience with this image of what can happen if we don't do it right. Definitely. Um, so, I mean, the most probably striking, uh, do you want to talk about Texas 2003 or Texas 2011? 11. Okay. So, most recently there's been a lot of uh, f uh, fervor over the splitting up of Austin into six different congressional districts, although by itself it would have more than enough to have one representative who, who could represent Austin and probably several others that would represent the interests of Austin as a whole. Mm -hmm. And instead, because Republicans were in charge of the entire process, it's been split into six districts where Austin doesn't have critical mass in any of the individual districts to uh, have legislators represent it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Good. I, I thank you very much, Janice, for being thank here. Thank you. Okay, James, thank you. Yeah, All right. pleasure. Good. Good. So we've been talking with Janice Thompson, who's the Executive Director of Common Cause Oregon, and jo uh, James Offsink, who is a member of the City Club of Portland. On the screen now are uh, website uh, uh, addresses where if you need more information on uh, either of the for either of these two people, you can go to those websites and, and make a connection there. If you are a local public access station that does not broadcast populist dialogues, please contact them and request they do so. Episodes are available to them at no cost at www.pegmedia.org. Our mission at the Alliance of Democracy is to create, is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more, visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy. Our crew today has been Janice Morris, Joan Horton, Tom Thomas, Roger Bates, and Beth Kerwin. And we hope that we'll see you again next week. Thank you.